This would be a typical entry level activity for someone starting out in this. Greetings. Um, to be sent on site with a drill rig to gather some data, do, do some things. Um, and so we'll talk today about investigation in general and principally in terms of what I'll call direct investigation, which is a fancy name really for either digging holes, trenches, or boring holes to see what's there. So that's kind of our, our deal. And mainly uh, in this, it takes about two seconds to learn what drilling is when you're standing on a drill rig. You only need to do it for one day to be kind of a, at least a cognizant of what's going on in, with it. Uh, perhaps a bit longer to become an expert, but not much longer. And we'll talk about methods which get applied to going through the first few meters of soil and then the next uh, distance into rock, just like Smithville uh, would be, for instance. Different techniques for different uh, needs. So we'll talk about it uh, in broad brushes. I don't, I don't need to go through all the narratives there. But if, you know, how, how do these things turn up? Well, they turn up because someone gets some bad water or an odor in their water and they wonder what it is and they get it tested and they see there's something in there that shouldn't be and so they write to their council and someone goes out and looks at a field um, around the house where there doesn't seem to be anything going wrong and then has to decide how to go about seeing uh, where the source is uh, and how vigorous that source is and how to deal with that source basically. And so you've been working in Smithville, a bit old now, you know, there was, this is the mid-1980s in uh, southwestern Ontario. Uh, but what would you do? You'd stand here, you'd see a field. I guess, actually, if you picked up a sample down here in your house, you wouldn't necessarily know whether it came from here or whether it came from here or <coughs> here, right? You'd need to do some investigation to know where the uh, groundwater is flowing. So typically, you can get things like that from a desk study. You go to USGS uh, reports in the U.S., or hydrogeology reports, which tell you something about the hydrogeology of an area. Or you look at existing well levels, which might be present in an area for domestic wells, to do a survey of those, uh, to try and figure out exactly what's going on in the system. Uh, in terms of where you might look up gradient, you'd imagine that things would come from up gradient. You might uh, do some kind of study to see whether there's some industrial activity that's logged, uh, just like in State College, as you go up towards the Nittany Mall, Rutgers Nice is a, a super fun site. As you go up the hill towards the Nittany Mall to the fork, on the right you go through a traffic light. There's a, is it a Dunkin' Donuts on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side there's an old um, chemical plant, Rutgers Nice, that used to dispose of their chemicals by spraying them on the lawn, basically. And uh, is a super fun site that uh, flows downhill into Spring Creek, uh, which is why you shouldn't take the, the fish out of uh, Spring Creek downstream of where that goes in, I think, still. Um, and so you want to know exactly what's going on here. We know that if we have a source, we want to know where the source is. We'd like to know what it looks like, what its architecture is, how it, what elevation it is within the subsurface. We'd like to know what the concentrations might be in the plume that's developed. And if we have that kind of information, then maybe we can start using some of the models that we've been looking at already. So that's kind of our job. And so not surprisingly, a typical way of doing that would be by drilling boreholes, which is what these uh, data points are. Uh, those boreholes would yield both core samples to see what the geology is with depth, allow you to say what the permeability structure looks like, capillary pressure structure looks like, allow you to take samples to see indeed what the plume looks like both in terms of its aerial extent and with depth and to design ultimately a program to deal with that. So Tony, that's, I won't go through the rest, it's kind of second nature as to what you do. You go to the public records, see what geological records are, see what other companies have on reports in the area that might not be proprietary, they might be public domain if they affect public uh, public health, uh, be able to peruse those and glean information from them to make your best estimate about what you want to do for the next step. And the next step could be an investigation which would cost more than just your time in the office. 
and it would be divided into these two categories, either indirect or direct. And it's not clear which one you do first, it depends on the circumstance. But by indirect, uh, I mean not puncturing the ground or penetrating the ground, but just doing geophysics on the surface. So if you watch any things like these time team things where they do archaeology uh, in real time, in, uh, almost archaeology reality TV, uh, ground penetrating radar is a, a well-known method. Just drag a, a transmitter across the surface of the ground. It emits uh, electromagnetic wave uh, radar, which instead of going up into the air is focused in the ground. It bounces off interfaces to a receiver. You can tow, tow these around um, a quad bike or something and actually you can push them across the ground. They're GPS uh, linked and um, the transmission of this electromagnetic wave, radar wave, through the subsurface, its velocity uh, is controlled by the speed of light, or is the speed of light, as it is of a radar wave, and its ability to go some depth is controlled, its attenuation is controlled by the dielectric con constant. So you drag it across the ground, you look at the transmission and the return arrivals, you know the two-way travel time, so from that travel time and the speed of light, you can get the depth of the interface. And so it produces a little uh, raster as you move across here, which would just be a whole bunch of dots with depth, which would represent these interfaces, which would tell you where the, uh, what the geology looks like, but maybe not what the geology was if you didn't have any way of otherwise determining that. So ground penetrating radar is popular to describe um, system. It's been used to also describe the kinds of contaminants that are present with those systems and their extent as well in the past. So quite useful. Uh, seismics are useful as well. Uh, often used by uh, petroleum companies uh, where this uh, you have a shot which for a petroleum company might be a bunch of dynamite buried a couple of feet below the ground or it might be a large vibrating um, platform which excites the ground. And then you might have geophones, little seismometers, which measure the acceleration of the ground, which might be placed on a length which are over many kilometers. And the reason is that if you want to look many kilometers into the ground for petroleum reservoirs at uh, you know, five, 10 kilometers depth, then the aperture that you have to have for the signals that would see that have to be sufficiently wide to be able to take that in. If you look at kind of environmental geophysics, then it's the same principle, kind of the same principle, but instead of looking at the reflection from a surface and the two-way travel time, so if you know the velocity, the acoustic velocity of the ground, and you know how long it takes for when you take the shot off to when it arrives as a first arrival at your geophones, you can use that to calculate uh, the depth of that interface. So you'd be able to see these in different interfaces, and you'd be able to say how deep they were, and you'd also be able to say something about the acoustic wave velocity of the ground, and you can convert that into a modulus, although that's not useful to you, and you'd be able to say something about the geology. For environmental surveys, they're usually much shallower. It used to be that because they're shallow, then if you set off a, a disturbance, so this might be 100 meters long, this might be 10 meters deep. And so it used to be that if you wanted to use reflection to get a bounce off an interface, that would occur too quickly because you're quite shallow to be able to take it up at the resolution of the equipment. That's not true anymore. But for environmental surveys, it tends to use seismic refraction. So the idea is that the typically the slowest velocity layers are on the top and as you go deeper down, the velocities increase. And so the fastest way for this wave to get from here to here to this is along the surface, shortest line of flight, albeit in a not a very high velocity layer. But as you go further to the right, it's much farther for, faster for the acoustic uh, signal to go into a faster layer, travel faster along that layer, and then decup to this. And of course, it's doing this at all the same time, it's just that the first arrival that comes here may well be not the ground surface wave that comes along through this in unit here, but that comes from this 
more circuitous route. So if you plot the location of the geophones horizontally, and you plot the arrival times at each of those geophones, you get a trace. And when you get a break in the slope of that trace, this is a length over time, so this is essentially a velocity, the slope of this. When you get a break of this trace, that's representing the depth to your underlying layer. So again, from this, in shallow applications, you can get a velocity out of it, and you can also get a picture of what the geology looks like underneath. Not necessarily useful characteristics uh, for you if you're doing the hydrogeology, but at least the lay of the land. So those are the two principal indirect methods. So I think on um, Thursday, the second week after spring break, we'll talk about that. Uh, but now we'll switch to the first of our methods, which are direct methods. So doing something, taking a sample, digging a hole, or drilling a, a borehole. And so it's useful to think about it kind of in the dimensionality. So boreholes are one dimension. Uh, a trench that you go into and map the geology, if you're brave, uh, or behind a, a brace, uh, is in two dimensions. And what we've just talked about in terms of geophysics is three-dimensional. So you might use something that directly penetrates the ground and takes samples to get a picture of what's going on with depth, but then use geophysics once you have this ground truth of where the boundaries would be to spread that over the rest of the site. Because if you're talking about a borehole, you might be talking about a site that's the size of a, a big field. You're talking about a borehole which has a diameter of maybe the size of your fist, and a sample that comes out of it which is the size of your fist and you're trying to extrapolate that over a much bigger area. So the better way that you can cover it, albeit uh, non-invasively, like a CAT scan for the, for the ground, uh, is useful in being able to fill in the, uh, the gaps. But if we're talking about uh, direct methods, we're talking about either trenching, which is just renting a backhoe for a day that digs a trench that can give you some idea of the shallow surficial geology. It wouldn't go into the bedrock very much, if at all. And if you want to really see something at depth below the surficial um, soil layer, then you have to do something like drilling. And so methods of drilling uh, depend on what you're trying to get through. And so we'll talk about three methods. There'll be auguring, um, air or water flush rotary drilling, horrible diagrams, we will look at some real pictures, or uh, rotary diamond drilling. And so in order of depth, they start off at the first and they end up at the second. So the first would be for soil only, the second would be soil and rock, and the third would be really rock only. So we'll kind of briefly introduce them here and then talk about them in more detail. So auger is exactly as it says, you have an auger, like a corkscrew, you screw it into the ground. Uh, they could be um, hollow stem augers or solid stem augers. Solid stem would just be like a corkscrew that you screw in the ground. And because you don't advance it as quickly as you're screwing it around, um, it raises the material up on its flights to the surface. And then you can sample it from the flights when it arrives at the surface. Hollow stem augers have a stem in the hollow auger as you might think, and it gets screwed into the ground until you get to the location where you want to take a sample, and then you pull the stem out of the center of it, the casing on the external keeps the hole open, and you advance a tool down the middle of it to be able to, to sample. So you can sample ahead of the, uh, uh, of the flights. You take the sample, you put back, you pull it back out, you put the central stem back in, which also closes the front, and then you screw it down another five feet into the ground, take another sample, etc. So this could be what you end up doing. So soil only. When you get to rock, the drillers won't want you to keep on beating up their rig by doing that, and you won't get any progress, even in weathered bedrock. So bad picture, and we'll look at some pictures later. Rotary boring, tricone bits on the bottom, um, push hard on it, they aren't motorized, they do rotate little cones, three cones on the bottom, hence the tricone bit. You rotate the drill string and push on it, they have little button cutters on there, like little M&Ms that 
bust off the rock by fracturing it in tension. You flush it with either air or water or drilling mud. That cleans the bit and flushes the uh, debris up to the top. You sample it as it hits you in the face, uh, if it's air flush, and you see what the rock is that you're going through, uh, and you can advance quite quickly through that. You can tell from the tone of the drill what it's going through when it changes from one uh, material to another. Um, you can't really sample very well of the material ahead of the bit as well as you can with rotary drilling, uh, but you can advance very quickly, put a well down very quickly, be able to case that well if you want to, be able to isolate zones within that well bore and take samples and also collect the chips as they come out of the, the drill fluid and be able to see exactly what they are. And so that's kind of the, the technique. And finally, uh, the previous was for rock or soil. You can go through both uh, of those. But rotary drilling is really for rock. And it is a cookie cutter, so a, a pipe, a drill pipe, that has on its tip a bunch of diamond teeth, uh, which are just on this tip. It's not hammered into the ground, but it's uh, turned and pushed. So it abrades a little channel here that pushes it further and further down. As it goes further and further down, the rock is static, and so relative to the core barrel that's going down, the core rises up inside it. Uh, typically, the torque on the bottom of the, of the piece of rock in here is high enough that it'll rotate it off and break it off. And so this will be free so that when you pull out the drill string, however you pull it out, it will bring this core up to the surface. You break it open, you pull the core out, you keep the core, you do something in for analysis of the core, look at the number of fractures, log it, send it off to the lab for perm testing, but you end up with a relatively intact piece of core which comes out of it. Um, and they come in a, a variety of forms. Uh, single barrel core barrels, double barrel core barrels, barrels where you can take the core out without removing the whole drill string, and we'll, we'll talk about those as we go through this. So those are the basic three kinds of uh, techniques. And so these are perhaps better diagrams that um, kind of illustrate what's going on. Left-hand side is uh, solid stem augering. Uh, middle one is uh, rotary drilling with tricone bits on the surface, circulation down the drill pipe, and recirculation to the surface in the annulus. Cable tools not used very much. Actually, this is how they drilled the Drake oil well. Uh, just a heavy weight with a shoe on the, the top. You drop it down. It busts up the material here and then you slosh out the material in a bucket as a slurry and then keep on going. Not very fast, but uh, was used, probably still is used in soil drilling, uh, but not much in, uh, certainly not in rock, uh, rock drilling these days. So we'll talk about uh, augers, and we talked about two kinds. Uh, so this is a solid stem auger, has auger flights. You drive it into the ground, you retract it, so you typically would add five foot sections. Uh, they join through a, a male and a female joint, which is a hexagonal fitting, has a clip through it uh, to keep it uh, from rotating. You go down to the base, it has a cutting shoe. Once you're at the depth you want to be, you pull it out and then you put in a sampler. Uh, the sampler will talk in 7.2 about what they are. They basically are different for soil and rock. Uh, for soil, there are also two kinds of samples. One's for sands and gravels, which is called a split spoon, which is an empty tube, which is of heavy duty metal, maybe with a tenth of an inch thickness wall, which you put on the end of drill string, and you physically bang it into the ground, count the number of blows to go a foot, gives you an idea of the strength of the ground, and then retrieve the sample up by just pulling it back up. And in clays, where the sampler is a bit like this, this is called a split spoon because it's two half sections of tube joined by a shoe and by a top. You unscrew the shoe, you unscrew the top, splits open, the sand is in there, you put it in a bag and send it to the lab. And if you're sampling in clays, 
It's actually called a Shelby tube. I don't know who Shelby is, a person perhaps. And it's just a, a very thin wall, maybe a 16th of an inch thickness tube of copper, which is four inches in diameter, which is also pushed on a drill rod, but then physically pushed into the ground like a cookie cutter, not banged into the ground, but pushed into the ground and then retrieved, twisted at the bottom to break off the, like a cookie cutter to break off the contact and hopefully with the sample retrieved up to the surface. Once you've got the sample up, you put the, um, the auger back down and you just go on merrily drilling. So for this, you have to pull the auger each time you want to make a sample. As a, and of course, the bad thing about it would be that as you pull out the auger to get a sample, if you've gone through some layers which are full of water and are very loose, uh, silts are a particular problem, loose and fine grained, so loose so they're not compact, fine grained so they have a low enough permeability that they keep the water pressures behind and the water pushes them out. If that washes into the hole, then the stuff that you'll then sample, obviously, is not the, the native material that's at, originally at the base of the hole. And so for so solid stem augers, you're never sure that the stuff that you take out in your sample, unless you look at it very carefully, maybe the top part of this is the stuff that just dropped down from up here. And so you have to be aware of that. One way around that, and that allows you to avoid um, pulling your auger string every five feet once you want to sample, is to use a hollow stem auger. So a hollow stem auger is a hollow stem that has auger flights on it, but has a central rod inside it. And that central rod goes all the way down to the tip and has, is a cutting shoe, which turns with the auger and removes stuff back. These are also cutting shoes that cut, and they just move the material up the flights of the auger until it gets to the surface. So you can certainly sample it when it comes up to the surface. You don't know quite from where it's from at depth, but you can sample there. <clears throat> and then when you want to sample, then you can merely pull out this central stem and advance your sampling tool along the, uh, the hole with the auger still in it. And there must be a hole that shows that. Yeah, right here. So this is it on the left-hand side in the hole. Uh, do I have one? Uh, perhaps I don't have one. I can't remember. My fingers aren't working on my touchpad for some reason. Perhaps I'm dead. No, so I don't. I guess I only have this picture here. So yeah, well, this is it. So you go down with the whole assembly, you pull out the, the drill bit and the central, a lot which is attached to the central stem. You advance along the length of it, a split spoon to take a sample or a Shelby tube. Uh, you either uh, drive it into the ground if it's a split spoon and, so and sands, or you push it into the ground and retrieve it if it's clays. You bring that up to the top, then you re-enter the, uh, the drilling shoe and just keep on going. So it's much faster. Of course, in joining the auger stems together, they screw together. Uh, for a solid stem auger, it's just a, a hex joint, a male and female hex joint with a clip going through it because you can go right the way across the, uh, um, the drill string because there's nothing down the middle. But obviously here, you can't join them by going across the drill string because you have something in the center. Tricone drilling is the same as um, solid stem augering. So you have a tricone bit, you drill it into the ground, you're pushing on it and rotating it. It's not, the cutters at the front are just breaking the material up so that the fluid that comes down the uh, central drill rod, which might be either water, it could be air, water, foam, or drill mud, washes down here. This is quite good. This is a non-contact pad today. Comes down here, takes the drill cuttings, and brings them up the external annulus, and puts them here for you to be able to sample, and then recirculates the drilling mud back into the, uh, through the tube. If you want to, you can sample the, 
the drilling cuttings to give you an idea of what's going on at the bit. You know the depth because you know how much rod you have, so you know how deep you are. And you can monitor the drill cuttings, which must come from there after traveling for a few seconds. And so you know what's there and you can bag them. If you want to get a different sample, if it's soil, you have to pull your drill string. Typically, if you're drilling with uh, a formation that wants to collapse, you'll put in either water or mud. Mud is just water with a bentonite slurry in it that is denser than water and pushes at larger pressure on the wellbore to keep it open. You'll sample ahead of the, the bottom of the wellbore and take it out and then merrily go on your way with the, the re-entry of the, uh, the drill string. Again, with the tricone bit, you have exactly the same problem. Since you don't case the hole as you go down, if you have a collapse, then when you sample, after you've pulled your drill string, you can't be 100% sure that what you're sampling is exactly what you think you are. So, um, solid stem and hollow stem augers for soil, uh, rotary tricone for um, rock and soil, and diamond drilling for rock only. And so diamond drilling is ex exactly this. The drill string comes up to the surface. There is a shoe which has, is a cutting shoe at the, the base. It is studded with industrial diamonds to a braid. And then there's some weight put on this drill string and it's turned so that the, this cutting shoe just abrades around it and the um, the core rises inside the core barrel and then once you have filled the core barrel you have two options uh, I guess I should say first of all that you're washing it with some drill fluid to keep the bit cool and to wash the drill remnants residue up here the drill residue is not chips but it's typically just ground flour because you're abrading it you're not fracturing it at the base so once you've filled the, the core tube, then the option is either to pull out the drill string with the core tube attached. Typically, the, as I mentioned before, the torque that's applied on the core would break it off at the bottom, not just at the bottom, but also perhaps inside the uh, core. So you might have to choose between which are drilling breaks and which are natural fractures, um, which you might want to know. Drilling breaks would tend to have little round circular patterns on them where it's been slipping against the piece below it. Or if you have um, a double barrel um, core barrel where you have the external drill pipe but inside that drill pipe you have a sleeve. This is where the core rises inside the sleeve but this sleeve doesn't really show it properly here. This sleeve can be extracted along the drill pipe by keeping the drill to still in place. So this would keep the hole open, no collapse. It would mean that to get the core out you don't have to pull the 30 feet or 50 feet or 100 feet or 200 feet of drill pipe to get to the core. You can just pull it up on a wire line through the core. So you drop down a wire line, it attaches onto this thing here and then disconnects it from this and just pulls it merrily up through all the drill pipe. You open the core barrel Typically you have two core barrels, you put a new one on that's unfilled while you're opening the old one, you put it down to the bottom of the hole, and then you keep on drilling while, you, while someone else, the engineer, opens the other core barrel and then logs it, etc. So that's, that's basically what it is. So those are the three basic methods. Once you see that on site and you've seen it for a day, you know exactly what it's all about difficult to convey in, convey in pictures, but we have some photos to show you. I won't go through that narrative, which is uh, from uh, talking about the pros and cons of different methods, which we've kind of talked about, but there is this table at the end of this that talks about these different methods. So it talks about hollow stem augers, solid stem augers, no idea what that is. Hand augers, if you take it into the field and do it by hand, if you're on your own, that's hard duty. Um, rotary drilling, where you're flushing fluids. Air rotary, when you're using air as the fluid. Cable tool is the Drake well one we looked at. Not really used these days. Um, there are sonic drills that will 
have a high frequency and in sands will just advance by jiggling the material and advancing through it. Um, we'll talk about direct push technology for soils where you can push a cone penetrometer into the ground and use the resistance to that to say something about the subsurface and you can also jet with a water jet to advance. A bit more exotic uh, and we've talked about rotary. I don't see and a hammer drill, of course, is where you have a, a um, not of course, but it, where you have the drill string and it's just physically hammered into the ground by a, an air hammer, like a big unit on top of a rig that physically pushes it into the ground. So, and it says, I guess, what does it say? It says what fluids you use, whether you have casing, whether you can drill in soil or rock, what kind of limits on the drilling those are, what but borehole diameters they are, whether you can get samples or not, whether you can get core from a core drill, and it's from a book that I don't recall right now, and they talk about reference sections. So those are the methods. So let's go on a magical mystery tour and see if we can see this. Perhaps I don't need that. So we'll just go through a bunch of different methods. So these, these don't really relate so much to what we do. These are called air tracks. They're in uh, mines. They're typically used for drilling boreholes, blasting holes, uh, blast holes. They travel around on their own um, caterpillar, so they, they move from place to place. Um, they, I don't have a close-up on this. This is just a, maybe a, a five-foot length of drill steel, maybe an inch in diameter, five feet long, with a not very sharp tip, a con conical tip like this on the base, which is then just air hammered into the ground. It runs off the compressor, which almost like a jackhammer, just drives this rod into the ground. It rotates a little bit as it is driven to kind of clear the bit, and then air is flushed down the hole, uh, hence air flush rotary, and the bits, the, the drill chips just come out. Never used for site investigation, just used to drill holes very quickly, which you then put um, ANFO or some other explosive in, stem them and uh, blast them. Very dark, um, again, not a rig that we'd use. This is a, an oil rig. So we're not talking about uh, oil rigs for the site investigation. We're talking about, you know, this comes on a, a flatbed truck, drills thousands of feet deep, has a tower to do all the kinds of things that we'll look at to load drill strings so you can add 20 foot lengths, drill down 20 feet and then add another 20 feet and then just keep on going. Has a, a working top table where you work and uh, too, too dark to really see much. This is what they look like when they're torn down. I think this is somewhere in western Canada, I don't know, probably west of the uh, the same places we'll go to when we talk about the other drill rigs. So, ready for travel. Why won't it go? Does it? Okay. Again, drill rigs for drilling uh, boreholes. Norman Wells, where we talked about in Northwest Territories, like a drill rig, uh, like for um, petroleum wells, but I think this is a clean-out rig where they're just putting stuff down the well on a long, either on a wire line or a long um, piece of uh, solid rod to clean out the well in the winter time. Um, so these are uh, rotary drill rigs. So this happens to be where you might like to be this spring break on the island of Montserrat in the Antilles. Uh, a scientific drilling program. Montserrat erupted. There's a volcano right here which erupted in 1996 and erupted until about 2004. The whole south of the island sadly was evacuated and lots of people, it's a kind of British protectorate, a lot out of 10,000 people, probably 6,000 people went to live in London and everyone else moved to outside the exclusion zone, which is in the north part of the island. So this was a scientific drilling program to actually drill some wells on azimuth out from the volcano, which was active then, 
and to install some very sensitive um, strain meters to use the observations of that strain at 200 meters depth and at maybe 5 and 8 and 11 kilometers out from the volcano to be able to look at the deformation signal and to be able to figure out what's going on in the magma chamber at depth, whether it's swelling or contracting, and to correlate that with what's happening in terms of effusion on the surface, cycles of eruption. So that was, so this is a, a drilling project in 2002 to do that. Um, started in November to avoid hurricane season, which ends the 1st of November, I believe. Some um, water storage using uh, some bizarre methods for that. Uh, but using rotary drilling. So this is uh, the drill rig. Um, it's containered in uh, onto the island. Uh, this is the drill mast. I'm not sure if you've got some, yeah, a bunch of pictures. Don't know if I have a big picture standing back from it. Yeah, okay. So this is a drill rig. Um, the mast lies down, um, but comes up. The mast is used mainly to be able to hoist drill steel vertically and so that you can put it in this turntable here, which clamps onto it and then turns, turns the drill steed and push it, allows it to basically drill into the ground uh, until it goes all the way down for a full length, probably 10 feet uh, drill steel. And then you raise another piece of drill steel above it. You screw it onto the, the part that's protruding here. You couple the top and you just keep on drilling it into the ground. So it's pretty rudimentary stuff. Um, so a close up of that is this. This is the engine, the motor, controlled by a power takeoff, hydraulic power takeoff from a, a diesel engine, I guess it is. It turns this round thing here. You can see the drill pipe going through here. You can see the coupling on here, which will put water, drilling fluid into this, which will go down inside the drill steel this is the, um, can you see it by the way? This is, uh, doesn't, no, I don't want to get bigger, so I can't. It goes into um, casing, uh, which is stopping the hole from collapsing uh, at the surface, and then it drills into the pristine rock uh, below that with the bit, a big uh, wrench to break it open, and this is just it as well. So I guess they don't don't zoom in. So this is uh, not coupled up. This is to be able to winch the drill steel up out of the hole, to bring it up 10 feet, to be able to lock on the bottom part of it here so that you can unscrew it and then take it off, and then put this coupling back on it and pull the rest of the drill string up incrementally. So quite a laborious jo job. Uh, a pit here for the discharge from the, the drilling mud, which is used to keep it open. Um, the drilling mud recirculates out of the well bore and gets recirculated into this pit and then is filtered and then re-injected down the central drill stream. This is um, a drill bit, so these are industrial diamonds uh, on the tip. Uh, water will come down the interior. It'll use these little um, grooves to flush out across the bottom of the tip and then return up on the outside, up to the surface. It has these diamonds here that ream the side of the hole to make the roll larger than the bit so that the, uh, the drill stem doesn't get stuck in here. So this diameter here is larger than this diameter here for obvious reasons. And these are also diamonds put here to be able to do the same thing, to make sure the hole uh, reams larger and the drill bit doesn't get stuck. And if you uh, want to be able, inside this will be a core barrel. And a core barrel will look like this. These are two of them. So this would go at the business end of the drill bit. Core would go up inside this as the whole thing advances into the rock. It's, uh, I can't remember, it's probably 10 feet long. Uh, so you get a 10 foot run that it can fill up before you remove it from the hole. And the top of the, this is the core barrel. So core would go up in here as it's cut by the shoe. Uh, 
did want to get that. And right at the top here is a coupling that allows you to catch it. So you can't see very well here, but there's a, an articulated coupling with a little cone on it. A close-up of that is here. So you have the shoe, you have the column of the core, interior core barrel, and you have this little cone sitting on top of it vertically upwards. And so this is what the, the core catch, the, um, the wireline tool anchors onto. So if you can imagine a tool coming down here that has a little ratchet on it, spring-loaded ratchet that slips over this cone, the ratchet flits into this zone here, and it's made a coupling, and it just detaches the whole core barrel and brings it up the, uh, the hole. And the picture of that catcher is this. So that little cone goes up in here. This is spring-loaded somehow. You press down on the sides of it to release it once you get it on the surface. And then the reason for having two core barrels is that as you've just brought one out from inside the rig, this one's empty. You drop this one down, keep on drilling, time is money, and then you empty this one out while you're just doing the routine advance. So, so that's rotary drilling on a mobile rig. A mud tank, supplying mixture either of mud, uh, of water, or of water with bentonite to keep the borehole open, and uh, a backup sitting next to the beautiful Caribbean Sea and I think this is next to uh, the Trans Airport which was destroyed by the volcano and relocated ultimately. Yeah, some pictures. It's uh, mounted on a trailer. It comes with its own trailer, stays on its trailer and gets jacked up on its trailer with these legs so it's stable and then with the mask ra raised. That's just for moving around. That's the masked. A very it's an expensive rig, it's uh, an aluminum mast, so it's very transportable. So that's what's expensive. The turntable on its side for transport, the compressor that runs everything uh, at work with the, uh, the drill steel going into the ground, 24 hours a day as it was, uh, operation. Okay. So this is also a rotary, a much maybe, this is like, um, a typical uh, mining exploration rotary rig. So when people explore for lithium, or molybdenum, all the rare earth minerals, etc., uh, prospect for them, they usually do diamond drilling. They're usually also lightweight drill rigs. Sometimes they drill at an angle to go into a, an ore body at a specific angle to be able to get better coverage. If you have uh, vertical fractures and you're drilling to find those fractures, if you drill vertically, you'll be very lucky to find those fractures. If you drill at uh, 45 degrees, you're much more likely to intersect them. So this is a, a rotary rig. You can't see it very well, but you can see it's at an angle. I guess the main thing to see is that out of that rig comes a core barrel with core. Um, and that core is quite valuable because it costs a lot to drill and is usually looked after quite well. This particular location uh, is, if, I, if I'm able to zoom out again, is in uh, Forsmark in Sweden. Uh, so right on the Baltic coast, just north of Stockholm. Forsmark is the, there are a couple of uh, nuclear reactors there for power generation. Sweden has no fossil fuels, indigenous fuels. All of its power comes from nuclear power and hydro. Um, and so that particular site investigation was for their low-level nuclear waste depository, which was underground at Forschmark. And quite close by, they have a high-level um, facility being investigated. And so interestingly enough also, they are probably the first to develop um, these repositories. And a big part of what they do is the consent process, where they basically pay communities to be stewards of these sites by making it worth their while, not by Im imposing it on it, very Scandinavian approach. I think it probably might have to work that way here when we finally get round to it, but um, uh, that was a, a site that was is now operational for low-level wastes, and the whole idea is to find out, is this rock good? Does it have fractures in it? Is the stuff going to escape by being carried by groundwater? Um, 
how do we characterize the site? So that was exactly the, the process. You've seen this before. Uh, again, uh, oh, it, sometimes they do, okay? So if you look with the eye of faith here, this is the top of a casing coming out of the ground. This is the silver, is the drill steel inside of it. This is a coupling that has a hose going into it for the water supply, which then goes down the drill steel. And if you take it on trust, overflows at the top of the tube and then just gets wasted, and gets thrown away. This is a power coupling that allows, provides the motive power to turn. This is a very small mast, which is probably takes five feet pieces of drill steel at a time, folds over so the whole rig can be picked up by a helicopter and flown into Canon, uh, the tundra, where the field season is actually the uh, winter because it's frozen uh, musk, uh, on peat rather than the summer. This is to keep warm uh, on a blower. And this is just on a skid, which is dragged across the ice to relocate the drill from one location to another. Oh, these get larger for some reason. This is the same rig, but with a solid stem auger on it. You can see the silvers of the flights to go through the soil in the first part before you get into um, the rock when you use coring. And this is what the augers look like. Hexagonal coupling, uh, male-female, with a pin that goes across them, a clip pin that clips them in place. And so they, once you get those, you just drive them into the ground. Uh, no hollow stem augers here. These are all solid stem augers. This is a bigger diameter auger to start a hole. Um, and these actually look like what hollow stem augers would be, but actually these are called Krell barrels. That's interesting. Which stands for Cold Regions Research Engineering Laboratory, which is in Hanover, New Hampshire, and they're for drilling permafrost. And so they've got a cutting shoe, and they've got an annulus. You just drill them into the ground. They have very sharp teeth because ice is quite uh, uh, difficult to cut, and the ice just rises up inside them, and you sample them, and they're for permafrost. So this is on a pallet, strapped down, ready to be flown out of Norman Wells on a, a 737. And so and you know exactly where this is because we looked at it it's before. It's on the Mackenzie River, which links, I think, Great Slave Rate with the Beaufort Sea and the Arctic Ocean, big Honkin River that goes up here through Inuvik. So you know roughly where that is. So uh, that's that. Oh, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, again, another one of these rigs. So you see, oh, they do expand. This is the um, casing put into the ground. This is the rig with the uh, tower for lifting up the machine. This is a project uh, 15 years ago, I'd imagine, to look at a probe which was going to be used offshore to be able to go down a petroleum well to the base where you'd like to be able to predict the pore pressures ahead of the bottom of the well bore. You don't know what the pore pressure is, but it's a problem if it's a high pore pressure. So this was a very thin probe that could go ahead of the advanced well bore to be able to sample pore pressures. And this was just a kind of a prototype exploration method here. I'll go and find the probe, actually. The probe that's down the hole, don't have it? No, perhaps I don't. OK. No, apologies, don't have it. Thought it perhaps I thought it was not useful. Um, so this is a, a rig. Mass comes down. It's on a truck. Has stabilizers here. Works in the same principle as before. Um, if we get a close up, the top of the casing here, the drill string going down here, a coupling that allows uh, <coughs> drill fluid to go inside, a universal joint here just like a universal joint in a car, to turn that provides the motive power and it pushes into the ground. The, return, the drill fluid is pushed down the center of the casing. This string here is wound around the threads before it's tightened to make a, a watertight steel, it's quite rudimentary. 
and this is just uh, a plumbing fixture to take the return drilling fluid and push it into this tank from which this line re uh, inserts it back into the, the into the uh, the drill fluid Again, you see the same implements, breaking drill pipe. That's what it looks like. Um, all drill rigs look the same. Uh, this is oh, this is a hollow stem auger. So this is the auger on the outside, the hollow stem down the middle. Um, you can't you can't put a clip across it, but there's a clip that goes into it. Uh, and allows you to be able to, to drill down with that. A tricone bit that goes at the, the business end of the drill steel. Um, the previous Montserrat one was a rotary drill with a diamond bit. This is a tricone bit. <clears throat> These three cones uh, rotate on their axis but they aren't powered. All that happens is that the, the drill stem rotates. These run as wheels along the bottom of the borehole and the protrusions on them break open by some weight of the rig on top of them and break open drill chips which are then sent up on the outside back to the, uh, the, to the surface. The connections are always tapered so they don't get stuck and so uh, they take off people's fingers if you get them in the wrong place and so they have a, a seating and the string that you saw before was just wrapped around here to provide a a good seating on that. Um, the sampling tools. Uh, we'll talk about sampling tools after spring break. Uh, I don't think I have any here. But if the sampling tools are advanced, then the other thing that we could look at I can't see a uh, desktop. Not electronic. Yes, is it? So maybe a picture, paint, a movie paints a thousand words. I don't know. Oh yeah, this is it. So this is the probe, which is just, if you look at this, kill the volume which is a, like a pencil that goes beyond the bottom of a probe, which is supposed to go down a well and to measure the pore pressure ahead of, the, uh, of where the drilling has got in petroleum reservoirs. This is in the suburbs of Boston. And this is it. So the universal joint, the motive power, the head frame or the, the drilling mast, with rams pushing down on the, uh, the table as it turns. The force acting down on it and the turning of it allows it to move those cones across the bottom of the hole, break open pieces of chips, and those chips come up in the drill fluid, which is then returned into that uh, bath, basically. It's just a bath on the, on the surface. Not sure what we have. pulling the drill steel out just by raising it up the mast and locking it at the bottom and then pulling it up some more and then breaking the pipe. String to seal it so you can pump drill fluid down it and not lose it as it goes into the subsurface. Um, and see. And I mentioned <clears throat> split spoon samplers. Pull out the drill steel, put uh, a sampler down to the bottom of the hole and then bang it into the ground. Uh, it's a standard technique that you have a standard weight dropped through a standard height. You measure the number of blows. You can correlate that with the strength of the material for foundation calculations. Uh, and you can also retrieve a sample, a disturbed sample, by, by doing this. So that's that. So if I go back to pictures, so I, I guess. This is, uh, I like the table cable tool thing. This was taken in 2011. It's in Jinan in uh, Shandong, China. Just in case you're interested where it physically is, it's uh, 
south of Beijing. Beijing's here. Uh, and it's um, a cable tool rig. So you have a tripod that allows you to lift the tool. You can drop the tool by using a winch, just like using the capstan that was used for the, uh, the, the drop hammer that we just saw. And you use that to be able to advance by percussion into the, the subsurface, again, for um, site investigation. These are, if you're interested, oh, all over the place. I hope you can travel when you're working. These are in the most picturesque country on the planet, somewhere west of the Canadian Rockies. This is Edmonton, this is Calgary, this is Vancouver. Uh, this is Jasper National Park, right on the, the limb here. A whole bunch of, uh, well, Alberta is a petroleum, an oil state, a bit like uh, Denver and Houston, oil and beef. So there's uh, petroleum reservoirs all down the front ranges like Denver. There's coal all down the front ranges, a bit like Denver as well. So these were taken there. That's a tricone bit, again with uh, these uh, tricones and a my car keys on it. This is the same rig mounted on a nodwell to get in where uh, trucks can't really go very well. Quite common in uh, northern Canada. This is reclaimed coal mine land in the background. These are the Canadian Rockies towards Jasper in the background. Drill steel on the side. Um, a piece of drill steel there. You can see the, um, the drill um, mud or drill fluid entry into the drill steel at the top, coming down. This is the bath that you saw in the one in Massachusetts that was collecting the uh, return drilling fluid with actually a piezometer left in the hole that was there. This is near the same site. This is a hollow stem auger rig. It has a stem down the middle. It's off the hole right here. This is just covered in the, the material. Again, a universal joint at the top, turned by a, a turntable, and then pulled down by these rams that allow you to provide some push to it. And some in the drill mast here, these are piezometer tubes for putting in instrumentation in the hole once you're done. This might be that Nodwell uh, drill rig. The turntable that it goes through, you can see these little handles, these are little uh, chocks they are angled, you pull the drill steel up. Once it's above the hole with its uh, joint, you drop these chocks in, and so it can't drop down the hole. You break it by uh, turning it to decouple it from the stuff that's down the hole, and then you take that tube off. You bring down the winch, you couple it onto the, the tube that's present in the hole, you lift it up another drill string length, you drop it into these chocks to hold it, and then you just repeat. So kind of a laborious job. Uh, a rig that's pulled down, uh, the bath that's on the top for transport. Uh, same machine, drill steel on the side, um, a winch to, win to winch it into the mast, and then to add it onto the next one and to go down. Uh, these, these are kind of jumbled up, but they're very, they're all Western Canada. This is, um, hollow stem auger, hollow stemming, and actually in the ground, bringing up uh, debris on the outside, which is just being shoveled away. Of course, you can use this to figure out where you are at depth in terms of the samples, but really the, the beauty of using this tool is that you end up having a casing that's left in the ground, and you can basically sample ahead of that casing. And then once you're done, you can actually introduce piezometers in the casing, and then retract the casing with the piezometers in place and allowing the material to collapse around it. That's the same rig uh, to push it down into the ground. Same rig. And I think that's, uh, well I don't think that, that's drilling with instead of water, drilling with air. So if you can drill with air, you don't have to bring a water truck onto the site, which might be in the middle of nowhere, and replenish it. Uh, and then so that's faster and sometimes more convenient. Um, you don't have to reef run for water backwards and forwards to replenish the drill fluid if you're losing it uh, into the formation. Uh, so if you can drill, 
and get the trips to the surface just by the air currents that are pushing them up, then that's typically a, a great way to do it, much faster. Uh, rotary drilling, but in a different context. This is in, where do you think? Any idea? We're going all over the place today. This is in a place called Tournemir uh, in the south of France. Uh, it's close to Roquefort, which is the home of the Roquefort smelly cheese. And you can go and visit the Roquefort caverns, which are, yeah, this is Roquefort here, it's right there. But this is for uh, uh, the French uh, nuclear waste program. Hosts for nuclear waste might be Yucca Mountain Tufts or granites like in Sweden or clays like in France, all, all low permeability rocks. Sweden, Sweden doesn't have any clays. Finland and Sweden are granites. Uh, France are um, mainly clays sites because they have lots of clays. So this is an underground research lab where they're drilling out portions of samples to be able to use just with a diamond drill, rotary drill, doesn't go very deep, actually to be able to introduce a tool into the subsurface. And this, oh yeah, let's go somewhere else. Let's go to another continent. Where is this? This is a place called Beishan. Bay means uh, north. Beijing means north capital. Bay and Shan means mountain, I understand. And it's just in the Gobi Desert in in China. So it's China's current uh, projected experimental site for radioactive waste disposal. It's in granites, fantastic granites. This is a sample that's been brought out uh, from one of the rotary holes. This is just a, a rotary rig which is just doing exactly the same as we've done before. This is a drill string. This is the core as it comes out in boxes. Natural or drilling breaks, you have to decide. If it's at an angle, it's more likely to be a fracture. If it's straight across the core, it might more likely be due to drilling. All the cores are logged and cataloged. Uh, breaking core out of a core holder, perhaps, I'm not sure. This is Beishan, the, China, the Mandarin characters for it. Uh, a mud pit for the drilling mud to use them. And a makeshift. Uh, yeah, makeshift um, core holder for the core. And actually, this is the most amazing site for the core, to have core that comes out of a, a site that is in probably three meter, 10 feet lengths, and is absolutely intact for, uh, must be hundreds of, uh, hundreds of meters here, uh, is probably quite a good omen for a, a waste repository. You want it to be low permeability, permeability is in fractures. The fractures that you see here are sealed and aren't working as fractures. So quite, quite fascinating. Yeah, these, these actually look like two disused uh, core barrels, wireline core barrels, which are just used to, to log the core. And they do have camels running wild in the Gobi Desert. And so that was, so yeah, so these, these were all taken immediately before COVID. So I think they're October 2019. Um, uh, when there was nothing at this site. And then in October 2023, um, they have drilled, so they're drilling an experimental uh, lab underground, maybe 500 meters deep, which goes down along a, a winding decline, I guess, not an incline. And so that's that core in the surface facilities now. But now they're, they've uh, drilled, a, uh, extended a tunnel maybe two and a half kilometers, two kilometers into the ground, and maybe at 300 meters depth, going down to 500 meters. So ultimately, they'll use this to do lots of experiments that can, can characterize the hydrogeological and contaminant transport properties of these rocks if you put hot canisters in them and leave them for one million years to not go anywhere. And so that's kind of the, the challenge. So that was that. Yeah. So it's bored by a tunnel boring machine. Uh, so you see the perfect circular section and all the grooves on the wall. And I think this is what we'll talk about in a subsequent 
we'll talk about after spring break. This is the uh, attachment that goes on a Shelby tube, one of these cookie cutters that is put in the bottom of the hole and pushed into the borehole to take a cookie sample and then bring it up to the surface. Again, from the, the site in uh, Massachusetts. So that's it.